What's up, everybody? In today's video, I will be doing a breakdown on every single draft pick by the Green Bay Packers. Some were phenomenal picks, some were questionable picks, but in terms of taking care of needs, I believe this was a great draft by the Green Bay Packers. So without further ado, let's begin the video. So in round one, pick 25, the Green Bay Packers selected Jordan Morgan. He is such a versatile offensive lineman. He could play left tackle, in which he was a left tackle at the college level, but he can also play right guard. Um, the Green Bay Packers did have some questions on the offensive line in terms of competition at the right guard position. And with Bakhtiara leaving, there are questions at the left tackle position. But Jordan Morgan, he's a plug-and-play starter at the left tackle and right guard. Um, the one thing that I was questionable about was the value of picking Jordan at pick 25. Um, when I made mock draft videos, I did not have him selected in the first round. But even when I did um, do mock drafts for the Green Bay Packers, I was either trading back or just staying put, picking someone else in the first round and grabbing Jordan Morgan at pick 41. So, um, But based on how the board was falling, I believe that linemen were just kind of falling and falling. And I think the Packers just loved Jordan Morgan's athleticism. They believe that he could just work on an island, become the future blind side for Jordan Love. Or if he does not beat out Rashid Walker, I believe he would be a great plug and play at right guard. Um, but Jordan Morgan, I don't know if I agree with the value, but there were needs on the line in terms of left tackle, right guard. And I don't think there were any other linemen in the draft that could play right guard or left tackle in the plug and play style. Um, so I give the Green Bay Packers an A in terms of taking care of the team need in Jordan Morgan. Um, the value of it was like a B, B minus, but I give this pick a, a B plus. I give this plus, I give this a grade a B plus. Um, Jordan Love is the franchise quarterback. You have to protect them. And just getting a versatile offensive lineman like Jordan Morgan, he gives me like Zach Tom, out in Jenkins vibes in terms of versatility, put him in left tackle. He will be good right guard. He'll be good. So it's great to have versatile offensive linemen. I think Gutekus did a good job getting that top need in round one just to get it over with. So I give this grade a B, but overall phenomenal pick. I'll give it a B just based off the value of getting Jordan Morgan. Now round two, pick 45, Edrin Cooper, the number one off ball linebacker. I just felt like when you were looking at mock drafts for the Green Bay Packers, whether it's through the website or other videos, I do believe that Edrin Cooper was a consensus pick 41 at the Green Bay Packers um, with the Packers switching to a 4-3 defense. Um, you're going to need to have speed. You're going to need to have linebackers that can play the pass or rush the quarterback. Edrin Cooper would be a phenomenal pick and a great duo for um quay walker um isaiah mcduffie he will be starting at the mic most likely i believe he's great in like run situations i don't know how i feel about him being like an everyday pass linebacker and i think this is where edrin cooper can come in um i think jeff halfley could have quite a field day utilizing edrin cooper around the defense kind of use him like a little micah parsons type style have him rushing off the edge crashing down the middle dropping back in coverage. He has elite sideline to sideline ability. He's very quick. The consensus number one off-ball linebacker. I give this grade an A+. Plus. I mean, for the Packers to trade back four spots um, and still get Edrin Cooper, which is the number one off-ball linebacker, amazing pick. Brian Gunacus started round two hot. Um, as you can see, he has a like, a 9.13 relative athletic score. The Packers were highly interested in him um, through the senior bowl, I believe he participated in, but also in the NFL combine. But overall, this was a great pick by the Green Bay Packers. Phenomenal job by Brian Gunacoust. And just him and Quay Walker would just provide elite sideline and sideline ability and will be a great fit for the nickel defense all as well as the 4-3 defense but Edron Cooper solid pick at pick 45 that's an A plus round two pick 58 Javon Bullard free safety out of Georgia coming into the draft Brian Gunacus wanted an interchangeable safety 
which means can he play the safety role? Can he come down and probably play the nickel, the slot, and kind of press down, just be, being flexible in the defense? When he said that, Javon Bullard came to mind. I know a lot of Packer fans wanted Cooper DeJean. I saw Cooper DeJean's name in every single mock draft, every single website for the Green Bay Packers, and I definitely understand you know, him being from Iowa, chess piece on the defense, but I just believe that Javon Bowler was a better fit for this press man scheme than Cooper DeJean. Um, Javon Bowler is a phenomenal press man slot corner. I believe he gave up 0.84 per slot coverage in press man coverage out of like 400 snaps so not only can he play safety but he's someone that you could drop down at the line of scrimmage and just get in the slots face jam him up and he's also great in run support if you look at his defensive snaps the past two years at georgia 2022 510 snaps in the slot and then in 2023 362 snaps as a deep safety 144 snaps in the slot. So he's someone that can play the slot, play free safety. This is what interchangeable safety meant for Brian Kudegus. Can you play the slot? Can you play free safety? This is a great versatile piece for the defense, for Jeff Halfley. Green Bay Packers love Georgia Bulldogs. Javon Bullard is a hard-hitting free safety, but this was a great pick to take care of the safety position with their second pick in the second round, as well as taking care of a deep need at the linebacker position at, position at pick 45. Brian Grunekus was on fire with the first two picks with Edrin Cooper, Javon Bullard. He could come in. Honestly, I believe that Javon Bullard can come in and be a starting slot corner. He can. like He has that potential to be a starting slot. Or if Keyshawn Nixon wins that spot, he's a free safety. But overall, great pick, interchangeable safety, perfect fit for this game. We'll bring that championship caliber mindset coming from Georgia, hard-hitting safety. I think he will be a great duel with Xavier McKinney, but A-plus great for this one. Round three, pick 88, Marshawn Lloyd. Marshawn Lloyd was easily a top three running back in this draft. He had a great combine. He ran a 4.4 40-yard dash. Like He has speed. Watching him play, he gives me Aaron Jones type vibes. Very shifty. When he sees the gap, he's just turning the burners on. Um, he wasn't asked to be a receiving back as much. Um, and he also comes in with very low mileage on his legs. His quarterback was Caleb Williams. He was the star of the show, the number one overall pick. So it was more so on Caleb Williams, just proving that he's the number one pick. So it was more on um Caleb Williams show at USC as opposed to just giving Marsh Marshawn Lloyd the rock all the time but that benefits us right low mileage on the legs quite young blazing speed I believe he's coming into a running back room with Josh Jacobs AJ Dillon but if you ask me I think it should be Josh Jacobs Marshawn Lloyd being number two, they could be that smash and dash duo. And I know I'm not forgetting about AJ Dillon, but I think he's, you know, he's back on a low cost deal. Um, I believe that Matt LaFleur should get creative with AJ Dillon. We saw how he performed last year being the RB1 with Aaron Jones being out. Um, but I just think they should get creative and let's try AJ Dillon at fullback. Um, just imagine how the fullback dives will be with AJ Dillon. He could probably get you a good one to five yards. He has pass protection ability, receiving ability. He knows the play's playbook, so I'm sure as a fullback blocker, he can get out to the blocks very quickly. Um, I think they should get creative and just giving AJ Dillon a shot at fullback. I'm not too sure if a lot of people will agree with that, but I, me personally, I think it would be Josh Jacobs being the smash bringing Marshawn Lloyd as a change in pace back, being the dash, and then A.J. Dillon just being the fullback. Just give you one to, one to five yards on the fullback dives, pass protection value, receiving ability, could get out to the blocks. I think that would be a great creative style for Matt LaFleur. We don't know what he's going to do, but I, th I personally think that's how they should kind of work it. I think that would be a, a great running back, fullback duo right there. And um, getting Marshawn Lloyd, who is a top three running back in this draft, the Packers did 
well on this pick. I give them an A on this pick. Um, they got the number one off-ball linebacker. They pretty much got the number one hybrid safety in the draft. And then to get a top three running back in the draft, like Packers did their thing in day two. That was Those are solid first three picks in day two. So I give it up for them. I think Marshawn Lloyd, Josh Jacobs, A.J. Dillon, that would be a solid running back crew. Now, round three, pick 91, Tyron Hopper. This is where I had the question mark flash in my head. Um, I understand, and I was just looking at his scouting report, he does have sideline to sideline ability, and I understand, you know, switching to a 4-3 defense, you're going to want to have linebackers that have pass coverage um, ability. From what I've read, he's allowed one touchdown in pass coverage out of 800 snaps so i think that's good to know that he has that type of value in pass coverage but me personally i think this was a reach pick um tyron hooper i don't think he's a better linebacker than peyton wilson who was still on the board i don't think he was a better linebacker than cedric gray who was on the board so i kind of felt like the Packers spent a premium pick on a linebacker who will probably be number four on the depth chart. I mean, I know it's Isaiah McDuffie's last year, Eric Wilson's last year, and Welch's last year. So I understand Brian Kudekust thinking long-term for the future pick. Like, it's like, hey, let's pick him now. We have contract situations that we need to take, you know, that we're going through. So let's get him now. Let's think about the future. So I understand this being like a future pick due to contract situations, but I don't think picking him over Peyton Wilson and Cedric Gray that were on the board was a pick. So now you kind of spent a premium pick on a player that's probably going to be linebacker four, a linebacker five on the depth chart, and he will probably find more snaps on special teams than he probably will be as on the linebacker. Um, Good pass coverage linebacker from what I've read. He could probably just match up with a tight end, match up with a running back. So that's, that's good to know, but I think the Packers may have reached a bit here, a bit questionable. Me, personally, at 91, I think they could have got themselves a corner. Um, I understand there's quite a logjam at the corner room, cornerback position, but I think they could have gotten like a cornerback here, maybe a center here, maybe um, an edge that can provide more speed because Preston Smith and Kingsley, Preston Smith is probably on his final year. Kingsley Yazambari is on his last year of his rookie deal. So I could have seen maybe like a speed rusher here, but this was very questionable. Um, I understand the long-term thinking of this pick, but the value and who they got, I don't really agree with this. So I give it a C. Um, so I give this C. So to end day two, I give the Packers an A. I think getting Edron Cooper, getting Javon Bullard, getting Marshawn Lloyd, those were three A picks. Hopper kind of gives them a C, but I think just starting off with heavy hitter, A grade picks, they they end day two with an A. Um, I wish this would have been a better premium pick here, but overall, I think Brian Gunnikus did a great job in day two, getting the top three, um, getting their, with their first three picks. So I, I give day two an A for the Packers. Day three, round four, pick 111 evan williams so the packers traded up here in this spot um evan williams has versatility to his game he could play safety he could play the nickel um he was actually one of the top safeties at the senior bowl along with javon bullard um he's someone that's very good in the run game um the past three seasons he had a pff grade of 75 plus the past three seasons so he's someone that if the um the opposing team's going to run the ball he's someone that you could trust on the field to stop the run um i do i may believe this may have been a reach here for evan williams um i know if the packers would have traded up i know brennan dorless was there he is a very versatile defensive lineman. He could be a three tech. He could come out at edge. So I believe having someone with a versatile defensive lineman here would have been great. Um, and also Jordan Jefferson was on the board. TJ Slayton is in his final rookie year. So to have like um, a gap plug stopper as a backup to 
get that full-time role next year. I think that could have been smart. I believe TJ Tampa was still here. Um, so I think there could have been better picks at round four than trading up for Evan Williams. Um, Evan Williams does provide great uh, special team value. I believe he's had over 500 snaps in special teams at Oregon. Um, he faced Caleb Williams in the Pac-12, so I'm sure having someone that's very familiar with facing Caleb Williams, who we will face twice a year, will be great to know. But he's someone, Evan Williams is someone that I don't think the Packers would trust him as a single high safety interchangeable wise. Um, I think he's someone that could just play the nickel, come in as a blitzer, come in and stop the run, maybe be like um, like a backup box safety role. Um, definitely not a single high safety, but in terms of versatility, just being a box safety, blitzing, stopping the run. He could probably be a nickel backer in some type of capacity, but I appreciate, I like the versatility. I know the Packers lost three safeties in free agency. They lost um, Darnell Savage, Jonathan Owens, Rudy Ford. So I'm, I understand Brian Gunduku is trying to just fill up those spots in the draft and just double dipping here in round four after getting Javon Bullard in round two. So I understand double dipping, getting a versatile safety. I think this was also a reach of a pick here. I think there could have been better options, just like pick 91, but versatile safety, which is what Brian Gudukus wants. So I I definitely agree. I, I definitely agree with it, but I kind of give the pick here a C plus. C plus because I think the Packers jumped up about 15 spots, I believe, to get Evan Williams who will probably see more time on special teams than actually being a duo with McKinney or be on the field with bowlers. So I think this was quite a reach here, just, you know, jump trading up for someone who may see his time on special teams more often than not. So um, I, I give this grade a C plus to kind of start off day three. Round five, pick 163, Jacob Monk. Now this is where the Packers you know, kind of get an interior lineman here. Um, he played right tackle at Duke, right guard. He played center. I believe he played left guard or left tackle as well, but he's a very versatile offensive lineman in the draft. Um, he had a relative, he had a relative athletic score of nine plus in both as a center and a guard. So he's someone that I can see just backing up Josh Myers or potentially replacing Josh Myers. I mean, I understand, you know, um, trusting a round five pick to be a starting center next year might be a bit crazy to think for now, but you never know. I mean, the Green Bay Packers are one of the top teams in the NFL in terms of developing offensive linemen, right? Look at Rashid Walker, seventh round pick. He is a starting left tackle. So it doesn't matter where the Green Bay Packers select you. If you're an offensive lineman, I'm sure they could coach you, give you proper technique, and whenever your opportunity is up, I'm sure you'll be ready for it. So I believe Jacob Monk is someone that could be a great backup for Josh Myers. He's someone that could fight for the right guard position. I'm sure that he will be a great backup for Zach Tom because I don't even think there's a backup for Zach Tom. So God forbid he were to get hurt. I'm sure Jacob Monk has that type of um, experience there. And from what I've read, he's had over 3,500 career snaps, which is insane. I mean, when you have that much experience and that many snaps, you've seen it all, done it all. And for Brian Gunaku to grab someone that has that much experience who could probably play all five positions on the line and that many career snaps, he's a great versatile offensive lineman. Brian Gunaku loves that. Like I spoke about Jordan Morgan in round one, he's a plug and play left tackle, plug and play right guard. Elton Jenkins, versatile lineman, Zach Tom, versatile lineman. So to get a versatile lineman again in Jacob Monk, I think um, Good and Goose is hitting the head and doing a great job on this one, just in case injury injuries do occur on offensive line. So no matter who gets hurt on the line, getting an offensive lineman that's very versatile is very key to play multiple positions. So I give this, I give this pick a B plus. Um, I didn't hear Jacob Monk that much during um the draft process, but He's very athletic. Look at the relative athletic score. He is a five position versatile offensive lineman that he has a lot of career snaps. So I, I give this a B plus. 
late round draft pick versus tell offensive lineman. You can never have enough offensive linemen on your team because injuries do occur. So I, I give us a B plus. I, I, I like the versatile lineman right here. Round five. Pick 169, Kitten Aledapo. I apologize if I'm not saying his name correctly, um, but Katan, Kitten Aledapo. I apologize, but this right here is a phenomenal pick for the Green Bay Packers. If you ask me, I think he is a higher rated safety than Evan Williams. And for them to trade up quite high in round four for Evan Williams and still get a safety around later was a bit questionable. But getting out of Dapo, he provides leadership presence, versatile safety. If you look at the board right here, um, this is the he's a five year starter, but this only shows you the past three. But he's had over 800 snaps at safety, over 700 snaps in the slot. So this guy is as interchangeable as you can be. I mean, he provides the same versatility as Javon Bullard. He's someone that you can trust as a single high safety. He's someone that you can trust playing in the box. He's someone that you could play that you could trust playing the slot. So, like Brian Gudiku said, he wants interchangeable safety. This is as versatile as it can get. Um, honestly, he's someone that would definitely, definitely try to fight for that starting position. I mean, this guy is a stud. He played a big role in the Oregon State defense. Um, in terms of leadership ability, he played a big role in pre-snap alignment for younger players on the defense. So to have someone that's very vocal, making sure the players are in the right spots in terms of assignments, so that when the snap, when the snap, is, when the ball is hiked and the opposing quarterback has the ball, players know where they're going, they're not missing their assignments. He's very vocal, and that's very key in the defense, right? Especially when your defense is getting shredded. Um, miscommunications can happen when no one's talking, no one's making sure that anyone's in their right spots. But having someone that's a leader, look at the jersey. He has a C on his jersey, captain, five-year starter, more than 800-plus snaps at safety, over seven-plus at, at, in the slot. So versatile, he could be a day-one starter if possible. Definitely probably, you know, week one coming and probably be a backup, but he's definitely someone that's going to fight for that week one starting spot along with Javon Bollard. And this was a phenomenal pick. Um, I'm surprised he fell this far. Um, I've seen him get mocked a few times to the Packers, maybe a little bit earlier, maybe round four ish, but the Packers did a great job getting him this late leadership ability, stud versatile could fight for, a week one spot if not definitely a day one special team starter so i give this i give us a b plus this was a fire pick for total safety i i give this i give us a b plus he's a great stud and i believe he will be a great fit for our defense along with um javon bowler trying for that spot he could just be um in case xavier mckinney gets hurt god forbid him and bowler will be a great interchangeable safety duo as well b plus round six Pick 202, Travis Glover. He's someone that's a monster. He's six foot six, 300 plus pounds. Um, he's definitely not someone that's going to be a starter. He's definitely more depth, um, which was very important coming to this draft. The offensive line depth was very questionable. They could not go into next season with that kind of depth. So for Brian Gunacuz to kind of dip again for an offensive lineman in the draft was very key. This was more of a shot in the dark kind of pick. Um, Travis Glover can be a potential backup swing tackle. He's someone that could be a backup left guard, right guard. So I believe he's someone that could provide four position um, value at all four positions on the line. Um, this is more of a depth pick. Sometimes when it's like this late in the draft in round six, you're kind of just shooting in the dark for just depth, trying to find that um, gold in the dirt. Um, and as you see here, Travis Glover isn't the the most athletic lineman in the draft. If you see his relative athletic score is 4.71. Um, the Packers tend to like players that have high relative athletic scores. But at this point in round six, 
you're just trying to get depth. You're just trying to find that diamond in the dirt, gold in the dirt here. Um, but he's with a great organization, the Green Bay Packers. They're very great at developing offensive linemen. Like I said before, Rashid Walker is a seventh round draft pick last year, and he ended up being the starting left tackle. And he might be the week one starter at left tackle. So it just shows you the type of coaching, type of um, type of offensive line coach that they have at Green Bay. So he will probably won't be a starter. He will be a great backup. But like I said before, the Green Bay Packers do a great job at developing offensive linemen. So if bodies start to go down and injuries occur, don't be surprised if you see his name just being a left guard or a right guard or maybe a swing tackle. So don't be surprised if you see him playing maybe late in the season, maybe when injuries start to occur. But this is more of a shot in the dark pick. I can't speak too, too much on Travis Glover. Um, but overall, swing tackle, more depth pick. Um, and I'm sure with, you know, he may be a practice squad type of player. Um, but overall, more of a shot in the dark pick. So I kind of give this a C. I, I, I give us a C. I think they could have um, targeted a different position here, maybe get a corner, start to get into the, the D line a little bit. Um, but I, I give us a C. Round seven, pick 245, Michael Pratt. I got to tell you something about Michael Pratt. He's someone that was that was a top 10 quarterback coming into this draft. I mean, when you look at his highlights and you watch the games that he's played, he doesn't have the strongest arm. He's not going to throw an 80-mile-per-hour ball. He may not have a strong arm in terms of throwing the deep ball. He's not going to throw a ball 80 yards on, one, on just two feet planted. But he's someone that's going to give you a nice touch accuracy. I mean, drop the ball in the bucket accuracy. Um, it's not loopy, but he has enough speed and spin on the ball where when defenders just try to jump and try to deflect it is literally going over their fingertips and the receiver is able to make the ball. So he has amazing touch on the ball. He could be like the Matt Flynn 2.0. Um, I understand that they got Sean Clifford last year, who is the backup, but you should never be satisfied with your backups. I mean, God forbid Jordan Love were to go down they need to have a nice rotation of backups to see who can get the job done when Jordan Loves comes back. And competition is good for everybody. This can push short, this could get Sean Clifford to get better. This can push Michael Pratt to get better, especially with Jordan Love being QB1, being the franchise quarterback. But I think gain the value of Michael Pratt. I mean, I, I could have swore that Michael Pratt could have gone drafted to a team that needed just that had, that, needed, that had like a serious net quarterback, maybe the Giants, maybe the Falcons or Saints, like a team that just could have took a flyer in the late rounds. I just could have used Michael Pratt to develop him, be a potential starter, but getting Michael Pratt, solid value. He could be a solid backup. I won't be surprised if he's QB2 after training camp. Nice touch on the ball. He beat Caleb Williams this past season. So the fact that we have Michael Pratt that beat Caleb Williams it just shows how happy I am. Um, Michael Pratt, top 10 quarterback. I've raved about him as a quarterback in this draft, and I feel like a lot of people weren't talking about him a lot. It was, you know, Caleb Williams, J.J. McCarthy, the Michael Penixes, the Spencer Rattlers, but Michael Pratt's name did not come up a lot. So whenever you have a chance, look at Michael Pratt's highlight tape, look at some of his games, but this guy can throw a ball, has a nice touch, and he's someone that, I can trust as a solid backup. He gives me Matt Flynn 2.0 vibes. I believe Matt Flynn was a seventh rounder as well. So that kind of shows you um, that the Packers aren't afraid to get a draft pick this late and could potentially be a starter if the QB1 goes down and probably just take over the game for a few days. But he gives me Matt Flynn 2.0 vibes. Michael Pratt, glad to have you. Green Bay Packer, nice. He's a nice quarterback. Don't don't hate on. He's a nice quarterback. So I give I just based off value, and Gutekunst they want to get a quarterback to add a backup competition. But getting the value of Michael Pratt this late, I gotta give it a day. Quarterback isn't a need, but just the value of getting Michael Pratt this late, adding competition, and just how good of a quarterback he is in this draft. I'm surprised he didn't get drafted earlier, but I give this pick an A.
in round seven. Oh my goodness. This, I think out of every single draft pick, this is the biggest steal for the Green Bay Packers. Kalen King had an amazing 2022 season. I believe he was an All-American. So coming in to the 2023 season, he was a projected first round pick. I'm sure if you could try to find way too early mock drafts or mock drafts back in August or, or September, like before or during the 2023 college football season, you're probably guaranteed to see Kalen King as a first rounder. His 2023 season did not go well. His senior bowl performance did not go well. And the Packers love to draft players that participate at the senior bowl. Um, he didn't perform well at the senior bowl. I feel like a lot of reps that he took against receivers, he was just getting burnt a bit. Um, he was getting burnt. He was getting mossed a bit. Um, and then especially during the season in 2023, it just wasn't his 2022 self. But the fact that a projected first rounder who has first round talent fell to the seventh round and almost became a mystery, mystery irrelevant pink mystery irrelevant pick that was just disrespectful that's just disrespectful um Kalen King should have been drafted way earlier even if he had a great 2023 season but the senior bowl performance wasn't up to par and look at the relative athletic score 6.68 you know was isn't the most athletic corner so even if he had a great 2023 season but didn't perform well at the senior bowl didn't have great athleticism at the NFL combine at worst, maybe a third rounder late to third rounder at worst. But the fact that a first round talent cornerback that went this far in round seven, this is our gain NFL teams loss. Um, he should use this as motivation. I believe he will. Um, Sauce Garner is basically all over Twitter saying that Kalen King should not have lasted this far. Um, Jaden Reed said that King is just being disrespected, being picked this late. And I honestly, I agree, but Kalen King should just use this as motivation. He's going to a cornerback room with Jair Alexander, Eric Stokes, Carrington Valentine, Kishon Nixon. Corey Ballantyne. So he's going to a very good cornerback room who's going to push him to be hopefully back to his 2022 self. I believe that we could potentially see Kalen King on the field sooner rather than later because he's just, he, he's such a talented cornerback. As a Packers fan, and I'm sure I could speak for every Packers fan, whenever we see King on the last team of a jersey, I'm sure we have PTSD from that Buccaneers game where we probably could have won a Super Bowl that year. Um, I'm not going to hold it against Kalen King. That's Kevin King, and I damn near had a heart attack when I heard Kalen King. So I thought they said Kevin King, but two different people. They are not related. Um, we should not hold it against Kalen King. He's his own person, own talent. We should not put that kind of juju on him. And I really wish him an amazing offseason. I hope we can get him on the field sooner rather than later. Amazing talent. No way. Kalen King should have fell this far. Projected first rounder, first round talent. I believe he was one of the top graded coverage corners back in 2022. So um, coming to the Packers, Jeff Halfley, the, the new defensive coordinator, he is a magician when it comes to work with cornerbacks. He worked with Darrell Rivas at Pitt, worked with Rondé Barber at the Buccaneers, worked with Richard Sherman at the 49ers. So Jeff Halfley has experience working with top-tier cornerbacks, and I'm sure he could get him up to par with proper technique, proper coaching in the room that he's with the Jair Exam and the others. So I'm pretty sure that the Packers can get him up to par and help him hopefully become the next star in the cornerback room and and um, release that potential first round talent that he had. So he's in a great team. He's in a great room. He will use his motivation. But overall, this was a steal for the Green Bay Packers. No way that he's a seventh round pick. But overall, this is my breakdown for the Green Bay Packers. Um, for all picks together, I honestly give the Packers a B plus. Great pick in day one. 
protecting Jordan Love with Jordan Morgan. They had a phenomenal day two with Edrin Cooper, Javon Bullard, Marshawn Lloyd. And then things got a bit questionable with Tyron Hopper, Evan Williams. But then they did make it up with getting some versatile offensive linemen to be um, multi- that could play multiple positions on the line. And then getting Ale Dapo, who could put, who was probably one of a top versatile safety. And then they get Michael Pratt, Kalen King. They were to able to round out. And I gave them a B plus borderline A grade. But overall, thank you so much for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe to the channel as I will producing more weekly content. But other than that, catch you next week.